We're just gonna roll with it. If if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. We'll, Can't we'll do anything. Get back about on, it. and you guys can ask questions. Um. But. So anyway, so for this this discussion is gonna sort of be geared towards people who are thinking about starting with starting with cattle or expanding a cattle enterprise. Um, just like things to think about, things to keep in mind. Um, for those who aren't super familiar with um, dealing with livestock, particularly cattle um, or livestock in general. Um, but yeah, so I guess the first thing to really be, this is goes with any enterprise that you're thinking of starting for the first time. Um, when you're, when, if you're gonna start any sort of enterprise again for the first time, um, you're, one of the most important things to think about is is two things, one, do, like do you have the market for it like in your area is it is it a product that you can actually sell um because at the end of the day we're talking about doing this for production it's not supposed whether to be that's, a hobby whether that's beef seed stock leather for the height i mean yeah whatever I mean, whatever you can make it yeah um make your market work yeah exactly and it's not just for cattle like for for anything if you're mm -hmm. if you're selling like I don't know, wood chips or something like that. Like mm -hmm. you need to make sure that you can actually sell that in your area before you even think about starting to put together the infrastructure to make that enterprise work. Um, so you need to just be t like, understand, understand sort of the market, understand um, what other people in your area are doing or where your, where your target market is and what sort of pe the demand, the demand is. Um, that's like the first thing. And the second piece would be knowing if your land can actually handle it. And that's sort of circling back to a topic from a previous um, Chewing the Cut episode about understanding your land, understanding the connection with land and agriculture. If, if, if you have the acreage and the forage quality for cattle, like that's super important. The water accessibility, um, what else? The things you gotta think about like land-wise with cattle. Just like, yeah, like the, like the forage quality, like can, yeah. You are talking about yeah, yeah, yeah. Forge, forge quality, land area, uh, water, water fence. accessibility, fence. Fence is true. a good one. If you, um, if you can hold cattle, can you fence? Yeah. Is it barbed wire? Is there holes in the fence? Yeah. Um, um, water accessibility, like the ponds. Yeah. Um, do you have access to pressurized water? Yep. Do you have yep. things like that? Things like that. Like, you, you need to sort of understand whether your farm can actually handle it in the mm -hmm. first place before you even think about going down that road. Mm -hmm. Um. What's the winters like? Yeah. What's the summers like? Yep. And, th and that's also within the cattle space, your climate and your forage is also going to dictate what kind of breeds or crosses or hybrids or whatever, like you're, you'd be looking to get into because mm -hmm. you don't want to be bringing, um, you know, Highland cattle down to like Louisiana Georgia or, or Georgia. Yeah. That would be a terrible idea. But mm -hmm. at the same time, you don't want to be bringing like a South Pole or Senapol. Or Senapol. Yeah, that'd be even better. Or like, like whatever, like Brahma mm -hmm. or something like that to, you know, the mountains of Colorado. Like mm -hmm. that would, that'd be a terrible idea. So it's like understanding, understanding your land and understanding the breed in that, in that respect. But sort of more generally, like zooming back out, um, another thing to think about with cattle is that it, cattle are expensive. It's not like mm -hmm. sheep or pigs or goats or something like that chickens, chickens. yeah chickens especially <laughs> um, they like each animal you're talking like several thousand dollars per animal if not mm -hmm. if not high hundreds mm -hmm. of dollars on the cheap end um so and then if you're talking any sort of herd size you're talking like thousands and thousands of dollars of expense mm -hmm. in livestock and so that's something to consider that you know you're gonna have to be forking over in order to have any sort of sizable operation you're gonna have to be forking over a uh, not a not an insignificant amount of cash mm -hmm. no matter which way you slice it even if you're buying the cheapest crappiest stock you can get your hands on mm -hmm. it's still gonna it's still gonna cost you and also with with that cattle have a long long uh turnaround for for the investment so like say you buy some peppers it's gonna take another at least close to two years before you see any kind of return on those an investment that you made and so the um, time to marketability, whatever mm -hmm. you're doing. Yeah. If it's if it's meat, how long is it going to take you to finish the animals? Yeah, if, if that's the case, yeah. I mean, it could be even longer. Yeah, if it's seed stock, like, like what are you trying to market? Are you selling bulls primarily? Are you selling mm -hmm. unfinished steers? Are you selling calves, like, you know, like wean calves? Like, what, what's, your, what's your play? And that's going to dictate how long it's going to take for you to make, like you were saying, make a return on that investment. And 
and no matter which way you slice it, cattle are long-lived, slow-growing animals. And so it's not like chickens where you're going to be done in a couple months. And it's not like sheep where like just reproduce year like... one, they're going to be giving you a calf. They're going to get, they're going to become, they're going to have, they're going to become pregnant. They're going to get bred within their, within the first year. Um, if, mm. if you're doing it right. So mm. it's like turnaround times for lambs, turnaround times for pigs, turnaround times for chickens, for chickens. All that is goats. All that is a lot faster than cattle. Mm -hmm. Um, mice, mice, rabbits, Rat Ra rabbits for sure. Actually. Rabbits, though. Yeah. Um, but ever heard the term breed like rabbits yeah, or, yeah, like rabbits. Like, yeah, or whatever. Um, and, but sort of the flip side to that too is because they are costly, like you are, you're able to market the animal for a large sum of money. Like mm -hmm. one animal is going to, is going to bring in a lot more money than it would take. It's a lot less work per, per animal, animal. Yep. to market. Yep. Or the cost, and then you get more. Like your margins, work. your margins on chickens, for example, might be better than your margins on cattle, depending on how you, depending on the enterprise. But like... Think about how many chickens it's going to take in order to equal one cow. One cow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or one steer or one mm -hmm. heifer or whatever. It, or 10 steers. Like. Yeah. Then, then at that point, then it's like you better have a serious chicken operation to be, to be, to be comparing to it. You sort of, I, I, I sort of see what I'm saying with the, yeah. yeah but, yep. um, yeah. There's a lot of potential once you get yep. up and running. Yep. Like the barrier to entry seems a little bit scary. And yeah, but, that's the thing is the yeah. barrier to entry is bigger, yep. but the reward is bigger. Yep. And, and I mean, sort of along those lines, like something to also consider that's obvious, but some people don't think about a lot is that cattle are large animals. Even, mm -hmm. even your small Dexters or, you know, small cat, like those are several hundred pounds. And, um, and it, I mean, if not, a thousand pounds like because i mean our cattle are on the small end and that's 900 to a thousand pounds and a 900 to a thousand pound animal could kill you very easily if you if you do something wrong or if the animal has doesn't have the correct temperament or um it's like not so a, a lot, lot more yeah a lot more animal yeah a lot more animal and it's so crazy the power that those animals you, have. you forget especially around with when we're around like Greg's cattle, mm -hmm. they're so docile for the most part that you sometimes get lulled into this false sense of security where like, oh, you're going to be totally fine. Mm -hmm. And then when something happens, like today they were super frisky for some reason because it was really cold or whatever. Yeah. And like you and I both got like, not actually kicked, but kicked at like mm -hmm. a little bit this morning. And it, even just that, like seeing them just sort of like whip their foot just out in your general direction. Like, boom, it's, it's like, I mean, that would just, it would just take you out. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean it'd be brutal. And so it's just something to think about, especially if you have kids or you're not, or you're not used to dealing with mm -hmm. livestock. Um, cattle might not be the greatest idea, like right Starting off the bat. Out. Yeah. Because you get some experience under your belt first. Yeah. Um, and, and it's, it's just important to recognize that like Greg's cattle, you know, are extremely docile. And he says, and we agree with it, that you should be calling for and trying to breed a herd that, has that docility mm -hmm. but you got to understand that in the beginning the odds of you getting your hands on animals that are as docile as greg's stuff is it's it's pretty rare i mean mm -hmm. even even animals that aren't flighty but they're not that docile like they're still they, they can still mess you up if you're if you're not if you're not sort of squared away with with your animal handling so it just can happen in the blink of an eye too yep. you could be doing everything right and then you you slack for one second and that's when it happens and yep. then, you know, who knows what can happen. I mean, worst case, I mean, yeah, worst case scenario, hopefully it's just a, you know, a short trip to the hospital, but it could be really, really bad. So yeah. it's just something to think about with cattle, big animals, but it's, it's fun, but, to, but, fun but, to work yeah. with them. Yeah, it is. It's, yeah. it's different than chickens or yeah. pigs, you know? Yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That size, like sort of, it like it like humbles you a little bit, yep. you know. Yeah. It's like you realize this animal, if if this animal wanted to, yeah, I could be. There, eating it. Yeah, and there's nothing, right and there's nothing I could do about it. No, yeah. not necessarily kill you, also, but like if they decided it wanted to do something, there's nothing you can oh, do to yeah. stop it. Yeah. You know, yep. like you like when you get them all broke and they're in the system to to be to you know not run through hot fences and you know barbed wire and whatever. It seems like oh they're pretty easy to control and they are, but you just think of the back of your head like if it just. If, 
This, if she just decided to like run like to the back of docks and there's nothing run through fences. Run through fences. We had a we had a calf. We called him ugly. He was a three hundred pound calf and not not very big. He was scrawny too. It wasn't and, built uh, very. He wasn't built super yeah. solid either. He 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 got some pink eye. He got it in both eyes and he went blind for a little little period of time. And we were trying to lasso him and catching him and. Granted, and, someone with a little bit of experience yeah lasso probably laughed at yeah our attempt but. i almost got him but and but like you know he ran right through the fence and there's nothing we could do to get to stop him from that and he's only 300 pounds he's, yeah he's 300 pounds yeah greg was telling us the story of the neighbor he's got some big black angus cows and uh in the in the winter time his neighbor leaves and goes to florida for vacation or you know for vacation for, for a couple in february weeks. yeah and so he asked Greg to do his chores for him, and Greg was doing his chores, and all he he had he had picked up a bale with the truck, drove out into the pasture, and he's setting the bale down. He's gonna go take the netting off. He got out of the truck, and the heifer just freaked, took off, through ran through. It was a woven wire fence with two strands of barbed wire on top of it. And it was a good fence. A good it wasn't fence. broken or anything. Went straight through that, and when it, when she hit it, she went the, the she folded the woven wire down and went in between the barbed wires and just took off running there's nothing he could have done with that and that's a 500 pound calf like imagine a you know 1200 pound yeah bull or something yeah. that just gets no chance just crazy no chance he tells he told us stories of his first bully bought was named prince albert <laughs> um it was a big old charlotte bull meaner than snot and uh anyways there's there's a long story to that but yeah we won't need to get into it but it's like yeah, it it could have you know it could have seriously injured him or, or other people multiple other people. times. He had to take his little Alice Chalmers tractor <laughs> and get head to head. The bull was against the tractor. He'd use the tractor to push the bull into the next paddock. That's, That's how, how he mean. would move it. That's how mean that bull was. So, anyway, the sort of the moral of the story is that that cattle are to be are not something to be taken lightly. Like, um, mm -hmm. it's like they can they can seriously they can seriously mess you up and 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 the image of having super docile animals should be the end goal but it's very unlikely that in the beginning you're going to be at that point so um i would say if you're if you're really gung-ho about cattle like do your research maybe go and like work for a day with somebody who's got cattle at the very minimum like try to get some sort of experience with it before you just jump in and buy like 50 animals um because and then I guess another piece to it would be like custom grazing. Yep. If if you were just and we won't get into custom grazing because I think we talked. We about talked it last a little week, bit about it last week. week. We can talk a little bit more about it this week too. Custom no deal. Custom grazing, like if you were custom grazing other people's cattle for somebody, you have no control over those the genetics or like the how cat, they're handled. How they are. Yeah. They, they just drop them off and then you got to take care of them, and so they could be spooky yep. as all. I'll get out or, you know, super mean or whatever. But, you know, it's just part of that is like you're going to have to deal with handling dangerous cattle. Yeah. You know? And understanding how to calm them down mm -hmm. and, and, and like work with them safely because it is one of those things where they just get used to whatever you're doing. So yeah. mm -hmm. like because we move the cattle twice a day and we're on foot every single like at least one of us is on foot every time we go and move the cattle almost every time I would say every time yeah they're after, either open a gate or yeah open a gate or exactly or on a sometimes we're on foot for a long time and sometimes it's not that long mm -hmm. but the fact that we are twice a day every day they're so used to people on foot that mm -hmm. like we can have seminars grazing schools whatever and have 300 people walking around in the herd and and they don't even like they'll be grazing in between the the group of like strangers mm -hmm. they're they're that they're that calm and it's just because I mean, anyone well they it's, can it's get, both it's yeah. a combination yeah it's because of that yeah it's also the genetics yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. it's but because it's the it, you're right it's the combination of of that style of management and then calling for things that don't fit within the mold of that style mm -hmm. so like like things that get super spooky with you being on foot you just have to get rid of. And if you do that long over a long enough period of time and you continue to be consistent with being on foot, like they just get used to it. And Cause the thing is, yes, you, you can, you can, uh, you can call for 
docile animals, but it's still an animal with its own mind. Yep. And so you're not, you're never going to be able to get to the point where you could call and just without, without like yep. taking that time and getting them used to you, you're never going to get to the point simply from calling to the point that Greg is. No. It's the combination of calling anything that, you know, doesn't fit into the system, but then also, yep. You know, taking the time and working with the animals and training them to yep. to what you're doing. So and the and and it still isn't perfect. Like we have yeah. we have one calf that we call the deer. That's just like mm, she's like a deer. she. I mean, she compared to you know like the cattle you were talking about, like the neighbors' cattle. She's pretty calm, but compared yeah. to Greg's stuff, she's super spooky. And so, I mean, you just have no idea. Like her mom is super calm and laid back. And, mm -hmm. and laid back and all the bulls that we have are super laid back for the most part like i can't think of one bull that is like super heady no. and like looking around all the time they're all just really laid back and if so, they are they become a steer yeah and so it's like there's no there's no reason like genetically and management wise there's no reason for her to be the way she is and mm -hmm. she and she just is and so she's gonna be she's gonna go to the sale barn as like the next time that we've got a um, the next time we've got an opportunity to do that because mm -hmm. we're just waiting for her to get old enough where she can be weaned. Um, but you have to be on the lookout always. Mm -hmm. um, I guess sort of, I guess the the last like sort of little bit with the whole cattle piece is, um, yeah, we're good. The, the last, I'm just checking time. Yeah. Um, the last little bit with the cattle piece is just understanding that they take down forage and it's like even more than sheep, more than goats, um like it's just a big animal that just it's the big it's the closest thing to a lawnmower you know like brush, they, hog. brush hog yeah yeah they they just they, they take down a lot of that vegetative material and so with that comes the need for a lot of vegetative material for them to eat but then also the the space mm -hmm. and in order to get that proper recovery time so that you can you're not overgrazing your farm. Mm -hmm. um, and and that whole management piece with cattle can become a little bit more complicated because you're just dealing with larger land areas over a larger time span. And it just becomes more of a, a juggling, balancing, planning act. To it get takes it all done. a lot more planning. A to lot make more it planning. Work. Whereas you, you, can, yeah. you can fly by the seat of your pants, but only for so long. There's going to be a point where it's going to burn you yep. because you're going to either run out of forage or you're going to, you know. You run into a, a drought or some mm -hmm. sort of unforeseen circumstance. Um uh, and I mean, and then it's like sheep, you can, with, with sheep and, and I don't know, I mean, we can't speak with experience with goats, but yeah. with what, with sheep, we know that if you, if you set up the herd properly with the right genetics and you cull and like, you can get sheep to like thrive on the meagerest of forage. Mm -hmm. And, and with, there's a way, there's a, I would say that there's a larger margin of error if you set it up properly with sheep than there is with cattle as in. As in, even, even, I guess you could, you could set up cattle that are more like low maintenance than Greg's cattle if you wanted to for sure. Yeah. But I think like the lowest of the lowest maintenance sheep flock, which I would consider is what we have in the lowest maintenance cow herd, the sheep are going to be below the cattle. Like their nutrition requirements, they just can, they just they can, go feed they can themselves digest easier. They can different things, a, yep. lot, a lot different things. And they can live on a lot different things than cattle. Cattle need their yeah they're you know different different compounds or different forages yep they need a certain amount to survive and and yep. thrive whereas sheep can kind of thrive on pretty much anything and, if you yep. if you call and the other thing to also consider with with cattle too is like um is like mineral supplementation is a lot more important than yeah. than it is with sheep just from the nature of the forage that they consume so that's something that you just have to be aware of as well um and then handling facility wise like we would say from what we've experienced here, like at the bare minimum, you need to install a head catch of some kind. Um, mm -hmm. It's just so, it would pay for itself so many times over if you have a herd of any reasonable size. Um, you don't need a whole corral. You could build that. We've done it. You could build it, you could build out, it of out of gates. Of and gates or cattle panels or whatever. But the head catch piece, having at least one spot on your operation where you can like get an animal secured to be able to work on it or let it nurse, let it, let a let calf, calf nurse. nurse. Um, that's super important too. fix an ear tag. It's also, it's also a, a danger thing too. It's like, if you mm. have some janky set up, like there's another story like with Greg having this like wooden head catch 
or whatever. And he had a head catch yeah, mounted yeah. to two seater posts. And and he had a was it a heifer? He, it was I think, a full grown full cow. grown cow in the head catch, and she she busted the cedar posts off. And she would take she took off across the pasture with the head catch like on her on her neck. And then she tripped on the head catch and like did an endo, and Greg caught up to her and got it off of her before she could get up. Or but something. it's just like I mean that's like sort of I mean it's funny, but at the same time like you get so hurt oh, yeah. so quickly if if you don't have it, like a properly secured head catch. Mm -hmm. um, if you're trying to work animals, like we had to pull a calf in the spring with no head catch because we just weren't close enough. Yeah, and that was. That was crazy. So just it would have been so much calmer if we had, if we were able to bring her into a corral. Yeah, that but was, that was an experience. Um, so we I, lassoed her that time. Yeah, she wasn't really going. Anywhere. She wasn't going anywhere. But to, so I guess to recap, make sure you have a market for it. Understand the the economics of the of any sort of cattle business. Your time to marketability, the cost that it's going to take per animal. You got to understand if your land can handle it. You gotta understand that they are big and dangerous animals, that um, they require more forage, larger area, better nutrition for the most part. Um, and so just sort of understanding all those factors, but then understanding that like there's a, there's a big reward. Once you get that barrier to entry, sort of if you can get over that, I mean, cattle are so much fun. They They're are. so much fun to work They're with. They're awesome. They're just so, like, there's no better animal that fits that can heal land like a cow yeah you know? like a big mob of, of, of cattle. cattle yeah sheep can only go so far they just don't have the the weight to do it you know and you need a walk. lot of sheep to do it yeah you yeah need a lot of sheep but even still like a sheep stepping on on yep. the land and, and disturbing the land is not going to have the same impact as yep. a cattle just because they're smaller yeah that the the thought the big the size of the cattle is what gives it its its um land healing capabilities along with a lot of other factors but that's a yeah. big one that, yeah. that sets it apart from, yeah. from a lot of other a lot of other critters um yeah, yeah. that's good all right i think that was good into that questions was a good session um and it's now going to be opened up to questions comments concerns thoughts about cattle about anything about why we're not watching the super bowl you know anything like that? Like <laughs> that's a, that's true. It's going yeah, on right now. I know. I that's why I made a little thing. Like if anyone doesn't care about the Super Bowl, come come spend time chewing the cud because that's what we're gonna do. Yep. Um. What we got? Have either of you ever raised rabbits or smaller animals in the past? Yes. I my sister had a pet rabbit growing up. You worked on the farm on that vegetable farm where you had pigs. And yeah, we had we had goats. I guess it's not really a small animal. Yeah, we had goats. You don't have chickens, did we you? Had, we had chickens. We had you broilers had and layers. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Oh, I, but like, yeah. I was I was young enough, like that was when I was like six, 15, 16. I mean, I don't really, I, would, I wasn't, I wasn't like thinking that I was going into agriculture. So it wasn't this thing where I was like, it was just something to do. It wasn't this yeah. thing where I was just like thinking about, okay, how are we doing this? How is that making sense? You know what I mean? Yeah. So, I've worked with them, but I don't. Yeah. I don't have like a lot of input when it comes yeah. to that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, growing up, we raised our own broilers for meat. Um, rabbits. I built a rabbit mobile one time, but I never had any rabbits. <laughs> I was gonna get rabbits, but then I didn't. Ah, uh, I think I we did have two rabbits one time. Oh, one time. So there was a feed pan on our feeder, and there was like a bunch of glass panels sitting like against the wall this is an awful story the, <laughs> the rabbit jumped in the feed pan and it tipped and it trapped the rabbit in between the glass and it died oh dude. we found it like a year later or something a year later it was a long time oh it was awful <laughs> we're like i don't even know where that rabbit went and then like we found it one day like oh, oh, that's where it went yeah but i think rabbit it'd be cool it'd be a yeah, cool thing to raise be. they are very lean meat and they're, yeah. they're very high in, like, there's something that they're really high in. Um, but, but it'd be cool. I just, yeah. like, I have no idea. Like, my guess is as good as yours. You know what I yeah. mean? As far as, like, stuff that I've seen online, whatever, like, I, I, yeah, I'd just be only, trying to regurgitate. The only knowledge I have is, like, the, yeah. the Polyface uh, yeah. Daniels system. I, don't, I haven't seen a lot other than that. I've seen rabbit I've tractors rabbits. before. Actually, I did I did see I was watching a couple of YouTube videos of people that had rabbits one time. But like, I'd just be paraphrasing. It'd be like a poor yeah. It'd be like a poor version of just it's, looking it up. It's not so, personal experience. Yeah, I I can't really comment on it. Uh 
Are there any South Pole bulls that at the AI studs like CMX or uh, Gen X? This is a good That's question. A good question. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this might be something in the works. Um, we've talked to Greg about this actually a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Just because it opened up, it would open up a market for people that may not have, you know, may not be able to afford a. a, a Forty one hundred dollar bull at that time. They, maybe they have three cows, but they want to get some South Pole genetics or something. Yep. They can buy in, you know, semen and breed their cows, and and then effectively have those genetics. Yep. So that we we're actually in the process of looking into that. Um, we looked at some numbers and keep it posted. Yeah. If that's something that like interests people. Let us know because yeah. it's like something that's on the edge of, you know, we're yeah. just thinking about. So. And the other thing, although this, not not in this application that we're looking at because it's not an option. Yeah. But the thing that I was also thinking about is yeah. as far as like pe if people are raising South Poles and can figure out a way to do this because like you're the like international market for South Poles. That's really the only way if you're in South Africa, Australia, South America, whatever, like that's. Europe, that's really the only way that you're going to be able to get South Pole genetics unless you're, unless you can unless you spend a crazy the, amount of money. Unless you make the breed from what cattle are. Yeah, it, it, yeah. if you recreate it from scratch, you could do it, but... but you wouldn't get the original South Pole. Yeah, breed. but to get the original South Pole genetics, the only way to do it would be to ship straws. To, straws or cattle, and or straws cattle. are a lot and Straws cheaper. are a lot easier to ship than cattle, <laughs> but... Um, that's, that'd be like one of the only ways that you could tap into an international market for South Pole genetics. And so that's another thing. I don't yeah. know. But the flip side of the whole like AI thing too is like, yeah, the, the thing that Greg pushes and we agree with mm -hmm. is, is the, is like the, the, like, um, is like letting that, letting the animal do the work. You know yeah. what I mean? Like fewer inputs, mechanical or otherwise, like inputs from you into the system. And so like, it's, it's one thing to just, you to input some like self pole genetics in the beginning using AI, mm -hmm. but it's another thing entirely to have a full fledged operation with AI being a big part of that, like throughout its entire lifespan. Like I would be a little bit hesitant on doing that just because I come from an educated yeah. <laughs> source, so I, for those yeah. of you that don't know, I worked at a, a stud service. We collected semen on bulls. I worked there for a year and a half or so, and uh, yeah. it, like I think that, like you said, for something yeah. like getting some South Pole semen just to test, I think that's a, that'd be a huge, but to try to rely on simply AI... It seems like such a headache because you got to, you know, you got the cedars that you got to get everything synced up and eat. And then you got to, you know, bring it all your cow, your heifers or cows up and breed them all. And then like, you know, whatever, like the numbers, like 40% of them won't, won't catch or maybe even more. I think it's even more than that. Something, something, there's some percentage. I think maybe it's like 80% will catch or something. Anyways, then you got to put like a cleanup bowl in with them. And so then, I don't know. I think there's a market for like or show stock like that's where it, that's where it really f thrives as far as like commercial production you know like if, if if you're more doing it for beef i don't think i think it's a lot simpler to let the animals do the work yeah um and it's a lot more effective and probably at the end of the day gonna yeah. be more profitable mm -hmm. so. um yeah just 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 two guys opinion though yeah yeah <laughs> I mean, I mean, i'm sure if, i'm sure there's people it, out there who who it's a big part of their operation my, but it's not something yeah. i'd be interested in doing my uncle does a lot of he's got some jerseys and he also has some piedmontese and he does a lot of ai and you know for him he's small enough that it's economical it's more economical to buy semen than it is a bull which makes which makes perfect sense mm -hmm. um but for a site for an operation like Greg's, the thought of trying to get everything up and breed them, and oh, man. it's just so much simpler just to have bulls. Yeah. Plus, the bulls are just absolute tanks. And it's another revenue stream for you as well. So, yeah. um, what breed would you want to cross one of Greg's bulls to? Ooh, that's there's some. I was actually looking at this today. We've got a list of breeds that would work really well in a grass based system. So like. Black Angus, as long as you, you start, it, it's more ideal to start with smaller frame cows 
the across system. the board like yeah. any yeah. like and any anything you're looking to cross if you can start with smaller framed animals smaller gonna, frame we're talking a thousand pounds 1200 max for mature yeah. weight yeah um so yeah black angus red angus british white is one uh galloway not not melted, not melted galloway but just straight, straight up galloway straight galloway and uh murray gray those are probably some of the the top five um like ones that would some other ideas are like if you're in an, in an area that supports corrientes really well corrientes a sweet breed to breed to just because so think think of this we we've, we've <laughs> talked we, about this <laughs> ad nauseum on this pod on this uh we're psyched stream. about corrientes but if but if, so people who people who are hardcores and are on here to be like rolling their eyes when we're going back to the Coriente cross conversation, but we'll, we'll just just so lay it out. Let's there. say you buy let's let's say you buy this a Coriente cow for four hundred dollars because they don't bring very much of the sale. And that might be an overestimate. Yeah. But cheap, 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 cheap. You take you and then so you buy a herd of whatever 20, 20 Corrientes. And one South Pole Bull, the, the highest you can afford, let's say it's a $5,000 top of the line, Greg Judy special. Um, and you breed that bull to these Corrientes. And the first year, they have a calf that looks more, pretty similar to Corriente, but also pretty similar to uh, South Pole. And you sell that calf at the, at the market, it's going to bring $600 as opposed to the $400, $400 that you paid for your the cow. It's hypothetical. So now, hypothetical. Yeah. So now you've all like in the first crop, you've already you know made back your investment, and then you say you keep back the heifers from that first cross. You breed them back to their father, along with you know the their mothers. You breed the mothers too, and just keep that going. But you breed the heifers, and they calve, and now there's a it's a three quarter South Pole, one quarter Corriente. So it looks more like a South Pole than a Corriente at this point. You keep doing that down the line. And pretty soon, you've got what looks, you know, closer and closer and closer to a South Pole herd. Like 7 eighths, 15 sixteenths. Like, at that point, you basically have South Pole cattle. And so you've taken a, a cow that is just dirt cheap, nobody wants. And by breeding breeding up, essentially, you've, you know, added value to this cow. And now you, you've got this herd that's pretty... Uh, basically south pole herd but then you also get some of the uh, corriente benefits of, yep. of the breed like the hardiness and the heat tolerance and all that so. the only thing to remember in this whole like scenario is that it takes like two years minimum between generations so yeah. if you're talking like three four generations down the road you're talking like eight yeah it's time you eight have to, six eight years you have to have time on your hands yeah minimum so yeah and time on your side yeah like you you have to, you you have have to, to start recognize that it's going to take a long yeah, time. Yeah, it's not, there. it's not, a, it's not a quick, it's not a quick fix. You got to be like in, in the business for a long haul or like planning to be in the business for a long haul in order for it to make any sense. Um, so yeah, will they be pulled calves? Um, the, on and down the generation. Yeah, they will. will. If you're breeding to a pulled bull. And I think that in like Greg's, I think had experience with the fact that like there's, he had a client from utah i believe who bought a bunch of bulls from him a number of years back with the intention of pulling his longhorns yeah and and, he and, did it, it, and it's and it's working so like the pulled gene has some dominance clearly because if it yeah. didn't then like it, there'd be no point in doing that in the first place so yep you, you will get rid of the horns yep and it's also something to manage for too like if you if you're okay with the horns for you know whatever yeah. reason like I mean, it, it, I think it'd be fine to have horns. It's just, it's just, you know, understanding the risk versus reward and a bunch of different areas as to like, what's the deal with horns? You know, you're going to take a, you're okay. How about that? What's the deal with horns? You're going to take a price cut at the sale barn for the most part, because they're going to have to, horns. nobody likes horns. And if they're going to buy that animal, most likely they're going to dehorn them, which costs money and is annoying. Um, if it's more dangerous to work in a, in a head catch if they're harder to they're work, harder to work in a head catch and it's more dangerous more dangerous if they if they're nasty animals yep because they just have weapons or if, if you're trying to tag a calf and the mother has horns there's a little risk there yeah a lot more risk with i mean you you're know, still gonna get hurt if, if, if it has if horns it, or not but but at least with horns it can stick it right through right the through center your, of your chest yeah, as and, opposed and to you'd be dead as opposed to just a really bad crush bruise. your chest yeah um <laughs> but yeah 
But the flip side, though, is that, like, there's there's a lot of arguments out there that horned animals are a lot healthier, like, hormonally than than non than, like than pulled than pulled animals of the same like comparison. They've also got something they can protect themselves with if you have a lot of predators in the in the area it's something that i mean they got something they can defend themselves with so um i don't know it also looks cool i think i think horns are beautiful but um would you add new bulls each year that's a good one uh i would say if you're starting out absolutely not um if you if you if you buy the top of the line i don't know why i grabbed that Top of the line. If you uh, buy, if you buy a top of the line bull as as much as you can afford, don't sell that bull after the first year. Just keep him and breed him back to his daughters. And that's something that like Greg has done. Greg is Greg has done and has experience with and it's worked. So, and it's something that people will like have a firm stance against as well. So the thing is, so the definition of inbreeding is when a son breeds his mother. But when a, a father breeds his daughter or his granddaughters or great granddaughters, that's not line inbreeding. Breeding. That's called line breeding. And so, uh, you you already explained the scenario with line breeding with the Corrientes. Like, yeah, there's yeah. no way that you could do that without without line breeding. line breeding. And so, it also like when you're starting out, the cost of buying a new bull every couple of years is insane. And so, yeah, just keep them. And if they work, just keep using them. Until yeah. the wheels fall off when you start. Another, yeah, when you start. Don't, yeah. You don't have to do that. And, and another thing to mention, too, is you want to have a little bit of size. You can't do it with, like, 15 you head. Don't wanna do, yeah, you don't want to do it with 15. Well, you can do it with 15 head. You don't want to keep back bulls when you have 15 head. Cause, yep. So that's a different, that's a yeah. different thing. Yeah. Um, but with the, with the – so another thing with the bulls. So the alternative to keeping a bull would be to sell them and buy in another bull each year. The problem with that is it takes a little bit for an animal to get adjusted to your farm and so if you can get an animal get him adjusted and he breeds and he and he shows that he's got he's throwing good calves why would you sell him just keep him and he's already adjusted and he's just going to do better and better and better and and then the the, the calves are just going to be closer and closer to what he looks like as opposed to their mothers or you know and uh, and Greg's had has numerous stories of buying like great animals yeah from various people and they just absolutely fall apart and fall out of the herd like extremely fast. And it's just because they're not used to the very specific environment that you have. And that's the case everywhere. It's not just like, oh, Greg's got a really difficult environment for animals to live in. It's more difficult than some, and it's nowhere near as difficult as other places. And so Mm -hmm. it's one of those things where every environment's different. And if you find an animal that's like, what is it Ian that says? Like like the whole goal is for you to find an animal that can be healthy and breed in the environment that you have. Like yeah. it doesn't matter like what it looks like or what the lineage is or whatever. Like if yeah. you can get something that's just thriving in your environment, that's the ultimate goal. Because mm-hmm. they're gonna perform, they're gonna outperform even the best genetics. Yeah. Best genetics as yeah. far as like certified whatever. whatever. Um, uh, any other Midwesterners here trying to feed cattle through a foot and a half of snow and negative, <laughs> negative temperatures? Yeah. It's, we didn't have that much snow, but we've got the cold temperatures it, here. We probably have like maybe two or three inches right now, but it, it was... It was snowing when, when it got dark, so it might, we might have more than we thought. But, but it was one degree this morning, and mm-hmm. it didn't get warmer than maybe six mm-hmm. all day. And it's going to be like that for, I don't even know, like a week at least. Yeah. So... It's gonna be cold. Yep. Settle in, folks. Yep. You gotta bring it break out the warm gear, that's for sure. But yeah, it's we, we were feeding hay this morning in snow. Yeah. So we feel you. But then this afternoon we unroll the wire. Yeah. Yep. That we, was didn't have, nice. we didn't have to feed any didn't hay. Have to feed any hay. They yep. fed themselves. Exactly. So it, advantages of stockpile. Yep. It's real, folks. It's real. But yeah. What would you call a pulled longhorn? Long pole? <laughs> long hornless? <laughs> Shorted horn. <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. I like shorted horn. Shortened horn. It'd be like a south horn, you know. South horn. <laughs> a long south. <laughs> a long pole. Yeah, that's a good one. Long. A long pole. South pole. A long yeah. North pole. That's a good one. What happened to those two dairy cows that used to hang with Greg's herd last year? <laughs> so those were Alex's dairy cows. Alex was the former farm manager here, and when he left, he took the he took the animals with him. I think he's, 
Uh, he probably took them up. Either he took them with him or he sold them. I don't remember. They were like the A2, A2 or something. Yeah. Where like the milk is like something with it's the, a lot the easier milk is easier process. for people that have their lactose intolerant. Like they can still process, process it. it. Or yeah. Even like normal people, it's easier for them to process. Just digest. It. Easier for humans to, to digest. digest or but yeah, I I think yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Any more questions? Those are good ones. That's good ones. I apologize for the stream. I bet it's complete garbage <laughs> compared yeah, to normal. Is. Um, if it is, I, I'll i try to salvage what I can, but um, for I'm talking about for the YouTube. Um, if it's not, um, if it's totally usable, if I have like a clean file, like just have, go over to the YouTube and, and check it out because the YouTube channel, like if, if this file is clean and I can cut it up, it's gonna be way more valuable and easy to digest if it's like clear, crisp, like concise stuff yeah. over there um, versus this if it's sort of chopped up. Um, speaking of the YouTube, last week's episode is going to be up. It's just taken me so long to upload it because I finally figured out how to get it in high definition. So just taking longer. Um, it'll be up probably beginning of next week. I hope definitely before Wednesday. So. Um, just be on the lookout for that. I'll make some posts about it when it goes up, um, but that'll be up there. And if this is any good, it'll be up there too. If it's not, I'll make a post about it and say, I'm sorry, we'll try again next week. But Do um, you have any experience on South Pole Wagyu crosses? So the short answer is no. The longer answer though is that Greg's, Greg, from what Greg's told us, like Wagyu is an incredibly um an incredibly management intensive breed like it requires for the most part requires grain just generally yeah. in order to in order produce to function kind of fat. to produce that kind of fat and so i mean like the 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 genetics of the wagyu is what creates that crazy marbling but yeah. like in order to like get it get the marble get the marbling and for the animal to actually perform for the most part they need to be fed some sort of supplement and so he's he's consulted for people that have tried they're trying wagyu or have tried it or whatever and largely i don't, i haven't heard from greg any success story at all using yeah. grass-fed like wagyu i mean maybe there's a way you could do it maybe there's a way that you could cross it with something where it would work but South Pole. it just seems it just seems like it's a, it's high risk very very high risk for it to just go wrong um, yeah we've said it before though and we'll say it again there's hardly a breed that you, that you, that, that can compete with South Pole when you're talking about crossing. Like South yep. Pole crossed with any other breed is it's prob probably probably one of the well, best crosses. If you're if, if you're, you're yeah yeah if you're looking to, for, for grass genetic yeah you know pasture yeah. raised cattle regenerative, or, you know, regenerative systems like yeah. that kind of thing yeah like South Pole is They're a the great breed. idea. They are the breeds great to idea to try to get to um but. try to incorporate at the very yeah. minimum yeah. but. Yeah, we're not speaking about like confinement, confinement or conventional like cattle operations because, like, that's not that's, that's not, not why what, we're all here. That's not what we're about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's the time difference on uh, unrolling hay versus unrolling a wire in the winter time? Uh, it took us so thirty wait, minutes wait, today. Yeah, to but tonight. so to unroll to unroll full feed of like hay, which for like in the morning, it would probably t it probably takes us an hour and a half. Yeah. to do it and it took us and the actual act of like Doing unrolling the wire took like, took like 15 minutes 10 minutes if that it, the unrolling the wire to actually move them five minutes five minutes yeah we unrolled it then we had to go chop ice that took a little longer. yeah but like the actual act of unrolling hay versus unrolling the wire it's five minutes compared to like an hour <laughs> yeah so that's the, that's the it saves a little bit of time yeah the beauty of stock but when it's when it's three degrees out it's kind of nice to just be out there for five, five for minutes, five minutes, yeah. as, opposed, as to opposed to an hour. An hour. You gotta four K really vigorously in order to stay warm. Yep. <laughs> just, just <laughs> if you cold, just work harder. Um, <laughs> sorry. Cut I can read. The, I can read the next one. Four K. There's no more. Oh, okay. We're waiting. Um. Yeah. Uh, any more questions? Any more questions? Fire them out. We're, we're sort of trying. We're gonna wrap this up in a sec. Yeah, we kind of got on a little late. <coughs> we got on late. Um, we were 
we were, were monkeying uh, around with a stream. No, we were monkeying around with that grazing chart. That's why we set us back. Yeah, there's a. Um, anyway, we're we're Isaac and I are tackling the task of of putting together a, a the grazing. Joy. Not a task. It's a task. I mean, I think it's a, an awesome task. Yeah. But it's a task. Yeah. Of putting together of putting together a grazing chart for the farm, and Greg's done it in the past to varying degrees, um, and we're just trying to do it like real deal as as accurately as we can. Not because we need it necessarily, because we've done this now for coming on a year, and Greg's been doing it for so long that. Like we could, we could be successful without it, but it's really for our education as far as wherever we go next, like there's a very strong likelihood that a grazing chart is going to be a huge piece to whatever we're doing. So, um, just getting the reps in this year and into next year is, is going to be huge. So we started it. It's it, for people who are wondering, it's the, it's the holistic management, like grazing and planning chart or whatever. Um, and yeah it's it's pretty cool um from what we, yeah. the stuff we've started it's it's been cool to see like stuff start to like come together yep are you guys looking forward to using the wood miser sawmill yeah i'm looking forward to it yeah it'll be cool it'll be cool it's, it's uh hopefully in the near future once maybe this cold snaps subsides out of it. a little bit yep um, it'd be so cold it's just cold to do anything right mm -hmm. now um, anything outside that is plant grazing chart great 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 task, great task to be doing right now yep what do we got do you have any issues with snotty cow noses in the winter time is there any winter health concerns that you're looking for um i mean like there's a couple that'll get a little little snotty nose um, you when, when i left in november that yeah. that snowstorm you guys started to have a, like some some issues right we had a bull, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a bull. We had a bull that got real snotty nose and real lethargic. Um, couldn't even like he could walk, but he just you know he could you could tell he was under the weather, and so we got him up and we had to treat him with whatever antibiotics or some 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 treatment. There's like a there was like a respiratory treatment and then there was a like an immune system booster or something. He's and he, he he's, turned around. We but sold we him. sold them. Yeah, yeah, we sold them as a call. Yeah, he just didn't didn't didn't. Wouldn't make, everybody else was fine. Yeah. So that that morning, so what happened was, it was like a really wet, cold morning, that like hit a bunch of them. There was something like it was just up like out of the blue. Right before I left, it snowed. Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah. It, was it was like end of October. Yeah, it snowed. It end snowed of the end of October, yeah. and so it just threw them all for a loop. They weren't ready for that. And, there was quite a few that had snotty noses, and I think we had given them a, we kind of pushed them a little bit that night, too. Yeah. So they, they were, they didn't get enough, to, probably enough for, like, the temperature that it was, um, because we weren't expecting it or something. I don't know. There was something that happened. I don't really remember, but one bull got sick. But since then, we've had, we've definitely had some cows that we're going to be calling because they've gotten thin. Yeah. But as far as, like, sicknesses... So far, we haven't had too much troubles. Yeah, so. and some of them will get a little snotty nose, but like, yeah, usually they just sort of get over it. Yeah, um, a lot of things we just kind of let them work themselves out, unless it's something that's seriously serious. wrong. Yeah, like that bull, like he wasn't gonna make himself better without us doing something. So. And and because he couldn't make it in the system, he ends up getting cold. Yeah. So. It's he was not, a good-looking bull before too. It, so. It's not like you're just gonna let them die because they, because you don't treat with antibiotics. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like you can treat him, but then he he's just he not just what you is want. not. He, you know, it's just not something that you want because mm -hmm. the next thing you know, all of his calves are gonna need to be treated with antibiotics next time it snows in October. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe not, but like yeah. that's the that's sort who of knows? The who knows theory behind happen. it. But anyway. Speaking of sawmilling, could you see if Greg could do a video specifically on marketing the lumber he produces? He doesn't market the lumber. Yeah, the, the lumber that he produces is for the farm use. So I guess he could market, and we've sold like birdhouses. But that's a that's marketing a birdhouse, not but necessarily that's, the, But that's the lumber, yeah, you the know, lumber. that's like value adding. Um, but I would, yeah, like you said, I would say as far as like lumber, he doesn't market it because... Um, we at least it. at least right now he doesn't because yeah. we use it for a lot of projects. That's the, that's the advantage is 
especially with like cedar, it's very rot resistant. We got, you know, you know if you get a log that has a lot of heartwood, um, it takes a long time for that to rot. And so we use that for all kinds of like, like we use it for like dog feeders, um, a lot, that, anything tire that Tire tank with, installations. Like, yeah, outside. That was the big thing when we, we, we did like cost breakdown of tire tank versus, yeah. versus rock skirt. And we didn't realize if you, like we were just doing it out, like what you'd have to pay if you had to buy landscaping timbers to make the, to make rot the, resistant. the, yeah, rot resistant landscaping timbers to, to build the rock pad around the tire tank. And we didn't, we don't think much of it because there's all sorts of like landscaping timber size, like eight by eight, whatever, six by six dimensions. Um, to use for like 14, 15 foot long, like stock links or whatever to use for, for that kind of application. And we started figuring out how much it was gonna cost if you had to buy all that. And all of a sudden the tire tank became way more expensive yeah. than we thought it was. It was crazy, so, it was like $1,200 compared to $800. And the difference, something. the major difference between the two is the use of wood versus the, the, the absence of wood, like in the, in the design for the skirt versus the tire tank. And so yeah. wood is just expensive and especially rot resistant yeah Water, rot resistant wood to build like outdoor application stuff so yeah that's a huge one is like if yeah. you if you've got the if you know the mill is obviously expensive um but if you can acquire one that works and you can mill your own lumber it's gonna pay for itself it's like yeah you may think oh well, you didn't have to pay for, you know lumber's cheap because you didn't have to pay for it but you gotta think you didn't have to pay for it so that's like money you te technically make yeah. Like if you're using using that lumber, you're essentially making that money that you're using. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Because otherwise you'd have to buy it. But it, it it is true though. Like if you were gonna market it. Yeah. Like like you like you could make money off of it that way too. But value adding is really I think the yeah. way you'd have to go, which it's requires hard labor. To, the the thing is, it's hard to market like straight lumber, just yeah. because, the lumber industry is so refined and so streamlined. Yeah, streamlined that. The, a, a real market market that maybe needs to look I don't know a lot about it but a real market could be like custom, custom logging yeah. or milling custom like you milling go to somebody's people. farm that they've you know mill or they've logged out their woods or whatever and they've got the logs sitting there and they'll pay you whatever amount per log to mill this up for their house that they're building or something you know something like that or somebody just has one log that they want they want milled up for you, you know, just different things like that to, yep. be, to be able to do. Uh, but then that takes time too, and so yep. then it becomes like. But it's what you it's, it's what you want to do, you know. And if that gets your gets your gets you going, you know, that's awesome. Yep. Go for it, you know. Yeah, it's cool. You just gotta get creative with it. Yeah. Yeah. Market the service instead of like the end product. Yep. That's an idea. Um, or value add. Yeah. Bird houses, furniture, raised beds. Yep. You know, like there's a lot of different picnic tables. There, yeah, wasn't there some there's some guy in South Missouri or something that he's got this like raised beds bed business and for he was, cedar. He's looking for he was asking Greg if he had any cedar available to sell. So maybe that's yeah, you know, maybe that's a market. Maybe you get somebody like that that you could sell your lumber. You're looking to. for some artisanal mm -hmm. artisanally sourced. Yeah. Well yeah, and, and that's another yeah. thing that Greg and I were talking about is like if you if you somehow were able to get a kiln and you could kiln dry like oak, you know, yeah. for like cabinetry work or stuff, yeah. like then then you're talking, you could maybe make it profitable. You know, I don't yeah. I don't really know the numbers. I don't enough, either, but it's something to think about. Yeah, it's definitely something something super cool. I'd love to have a mill someday, just because. Yeah. Wood is such a good tool in farming. Yeah. Just. Yeah, it's an advantage to have barns, not barns, have like little sheds, because mm. we don't really have any barns. Yeah, yeah. Have like little little sheds everywhere that are just like have mm. stashes of different different dimension, like you know, yeah. cedar everywhere. Any kind of little project, we yeah. just go out and find it. We don't have to go to the store. Really, really, the going to the store part is finding where the <laughs> correct dimension lumber is. Yeah. Because he doesn't have an inventory of where it all is stacked, so you got to sort of like. Sometimes you gotta drive to a couple different sheds to figure out where where those eight by eights are or whatever. Yeah. There's lumber. This will be the this will be the last question. 
because we're, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna wrap there's it up. There is lumber on the farm for saw logs. Are any of those going to market, or is it just for the lawn landowners to market? That's we kind of yeah, we kind of answered that question. Have the pod pads been used much drinking this winter? <laughs> How are the new pod drinking pads holding up? That's a good question. We the the way we've done the rotation so far we have been we on a left farm right that, after we got them done yeah so like we finished them and we were gone and so and we've been on docks this whole time which it has zero drinking pads on it and so it won't be beginning to middle of march is when we're going to be on a pad again on the north place yeah it might there, be less there's before that yeah well it just depends End of February, beginning of March. Oh, no, because we got to, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, end of February, beginning of March, middle of March, somewhere in there. That's when we're going to be we on. Gotta get that done. We're going to be on a Judy farm again, which has several drinking pads. Yeah. Um, it also has a new tire tank that we haven't even used yet. Yeah, um, <laughs> it's true. Um, so. Greg's uh, very. We're good at starting projects. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm just saying, like, he's very gung-ho about these pads. Yeah, yeah, gung-ho about the pads. We're is. also good at starting projects and then and it's, then finishing them at, like, at a later date because, yeah, like, something it, else happens, well, it's like you know? we get basically all done, but then there's something There's, like, forgot, one so last – it's, like, the last yard, you know? Yeah. Like, you, you get something going, and you're 95% done with it, and then yeah. for whatever reason – sometimes it's a very good reason. You have to pivot to go and do something else, and then it's – six months before you come back to like actually finish the last five percent but it's just the way it just the way it works sometimes it's yeah. not anybody's fault are you going to build more birdhouse boxes this year for the pastures we are in the process of putting some up kind yep. of cutting posts and mounting them and putting, them up, and putting them up all right we're well saying that... the video got choppy i think we're gonna call it right there yep. thanks for sticking with us i know it was probably pretty brutal if i got clean footage i'll clip it up and put it on youtube at some point um this week and in the beginning of next week um the other episode from last week will be up by wednesday the clips and the full length episode hmm. yeah sorry thanks for joining us we'll see you guys next week